I just want to start briefly by uh, thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this symposium. As I mentioned to them uh, before everybody else joined, this was really my window to the world uh, during the, the pandemic. So uh, it's an honor to be able to speak here today. Uh, so I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate in the group of Momita Das uh, at Rochester Institute of Technology. Before that, I was a graduate student at Georgia Tech in the lab of uh, Professor Peter Younger, where I wrote my thesis on the properties of hierarchically structured filamentous materials. Um, and so today I'm gonna take a, a, a look at a slightly different kind of structural organization, uh, specifically arising from a structural correlation in, in assembling filamentous materials. Uh, so I wanted to just mention, first of all, that uh, this work has been recently published. So if I pique your curiosity today, uh, you can read all the glory technical details on uh, physical review research. And, um, and of course, if, if you have any further questions uh, from this article, then I'd be happy to, uh, to address those in, in correspondence outside of this seminar. Um, so to begin with, and I apologize, I'd like to ask briefly, there is a heavy machinery being operated outside my office. Is that producing obtrusive noise or? Okay, good. Nope, you're good. Good, good. Okay, so um, so, so in, uh, my, my collaborators and I uh, on this project are, are broadly interested in the, uh, the problem of osteoarthritis, which is the degradation of the articular cartilage that cushions our joints. Now, this can happen either gradually through decades of wear and tear or uh, suddenly through acute injury. Uh, this uh, illness can afflict people of many different ages and it's the leading cause of disability and loss of productivity. And so there would be a, obviously a boon to society in improving how we, how we ameliorate this condition in, in patients. Um, so uh, to this end, uh, we'd like to contribute to a deepening in understanding uh, specifically of the shear mechanics of this tissue. So um, there was uh, some seminal work now going back over four decades uh, on understanding the resistance of this tissue to compression and dilation in terms of the theory of poroelasticity. So I've linked a couple of, of articles that, that discuss that, uh, that body of knowledge, uh, but um, our collaboration uh, has, has offered some pioneering contributions to understanding the, the shear mechanics. Uh, so this is uh, graduate uh, work from a graduate student in the lab of Itai Cohen, now from about 15 years ago, uh, actually now just up the road from me uh, at, at U of R. So uh, uh, this, this shows the ability to image the uh, depth resolved shear deformation of articular cartilage. And so uh, my role and the collaboration is, is really to help uh, interpret some of these findings through uh, mathematical modeling. And so to really make sense of this all, first we need kind of a picture in our heads of, of what this tissue looks like and what, what it's made of. So uh, articular cartilage is a composite material that uh, consists of a stiff type two collagen network embedded within a polyelectrolyte gel, a backbone of which is hyaluronic acid, and then it has uh, side chains uh, belonging to the family of molecules called glycosaminoglycans. Um, so, so really uh, the mechanics of the tissue are, are understood as a, in terms of these, these two uh, phases acting in concert. Um, and there's previous work uh, from the collaboration describing how to model the interplay between those two phases. But today, I'd like to focus uh, specifically on an aspect of the spatial organization of collagen in this tissue. Um, so then I, I wanna also emphasize this won't be a one-off because this uh, basic sort of structural motif is ubiquitous in biological tissues. Uh, as seen here in this uh, image of a red blood cell membrane or in this micrograph of, of skin. So uh, we expect some of the findings uh, from our work could, could also do, yield some insight into other systems. Um, so of course, those micrographs, 
those show the full richness of the tissue. Today, uh, I'll be focusing largely on a simplified model that, that captures the essential details. Uh, so we I, idealize the network of collagen fibers as a Kagome lattice. We choose the Kagome lattice because in its fully connected state, you can see it has a connectivity of four. That means every vertex in this network is connected to four nearest neighbors. Uh, and so that mimics the, the structure that we presume for the, the collagen network in, in which uh, collagen fibers are, are chemically cross-linked to one another. Uh, so then uh, adjacent parallel bonds are presumed to represent uh, contiguous segments of a collagen fiber, whereas the vertices in this network represent the chemical crosslinks that join fibers together. And then we also assume that the crosslinks permit free rotation, that the kind of the torsional stiffness of the crosslinks is negligibly weak in comparison with the bending rigidity of collagen fibers. So, so the vertices are really just here to impose a certain network topology on, on this structure. Uh, now, we can uh, include only a select subset of the bonds, and that sort of serves as a proxy for the concentration of collagen in this, uh, in this model system. And so uh, we can vary the portion of bonds retained from zero to one. So here I show you on the left a case in which all bonds are retained, a case in the right in which only 65% of bonds have been retained. Uh, now I'm using the nomenclature bond portion, uh, whereas some other researchers will, will use the nomenclature bond occupation probability. That use of the term bond portion is deliberate, and, and you'll see why that's a useful distinction for today's talk uh, shortly. Um, so then, of course, we need some model that describes how a deformation of this material is resisted by elastic forces. Now, because the uh, mesh size of this network, the typical spacing between crosslinks is small in comparison with the persistence length of the polymer, we presume that the elasticity is dominated by the mechanical work that must be performed to stretch and bend the elements of the network uh, rather than configurational entropy, which might dominate in the case of a, a hydrogel or a, a vulcanized rubber. So uh, the first term in, in our energy uh, punishes stretching of bonds. So here alpha is a spring stiffness. Uh, P sub ij is equal to one if the bond connecting vertices i and j is retained, and it's zero if that uh, bond is not retained. And then u sub ij gives us the, uh, the relative displacements, uh, the difference in displacement between vertices i and uh, vertex i and vertex j. And then r hat is simply a, a unit vector. Uh, from one vertex to the other in the network's rest state. Uh, we also punish the bending uh, of, of fibers by constraining the angles between uh, parallel and uh, contiguous bonds in our network according to a bending energy, a bending stiffness kappa. And then uh, we now have terms for both the uh, retention of bond, the bond from vertex i to vertex j, and then from vertex j to vertex k, since this bending is in effect a three-body potential that couples three different vertices in the network. Okay. So then once we've established the basic rules of the game, we now uh, want to simulate the shear mechanics of, of our networks. So to do this, we'll pin the vertices along the bottom of the network. We'll apply a small uniform shear at the right, we'll have, and we'll have uh, periodic boundary conditions along the left and right edges. And so then from here, we start by, uh, we, we seek a, a zero force solution. Now, the energy I showed you previously is actually a quadratic function of the, uh, the displacement field. And so we can uh, then, in a straightforward way, calculate the, the residual force uh, on the vertices of the network corresponding to a certain configuration. So we want to make that force zero subject to the, the constraints at the boundary. Um, so we initially guess that the deformation field is affine, which basically means the whole network follows one global linear transformation. 
We then relax the network to a minimum energy state about that initial affine guess and compute the residual strain energy in the network from which we can infer a shear modulus. Uh, so just to kind of show you uh, what it looks like as we, as we ratchet up the pseudo concentration of, of one of these materials, uh, here I've only retained 40% uh, of the bonds and, and then applied a small shear and uh, the color bar indicates the magnitude of the strain that uh, a bond has borne. And so you can see initially this network can uh, rearrange with negligibly little strain being borne by any of its bonds. So then as we ratchet up the concentration, eventually we're going to see a system spanning cluster emerge in which all of the bonds now bear an appreciable strain. And so this means that if uh, you and your friend are holding opposite sides of this network and your friend pulls on one end, you'll now be able to feel a tug at your end. And so that is called rigidity percolation, which is a distinct phenomenon from connectivity percolation. So connectivity percolation merely demands that uh, there be a path that one could walk from one side of the network to the other. But rigidity percolation specifically demands that the network be able to transmit force across its entire breadth. Okay. Now, this is a little bit of a, this is a well-established story so far, but there's a new wrinkle that our collaboration uh, wanted to tackle in, in the work I'm, I'm talking about today. And that arises because uh, many tissues actually have a somewhat heterogeneous spatial distribution of material, whereas what I've showed you so far concerns merely a homogeneous distribution of material. So here uh, you see, for instance, um, an engineered nasal cartilage construct. Now, uh, the proteoglycans uh, in the cartilage are stained in red. I uh, mentioned previously, this is a composite material. Uh, that, and in blue, you can see collagen and, and then little dots, which are specialized cells called chondrocytes, which are responsible for extruding and digesting uh, collagen. And, and so you can see that the material sort of coalesces initially about the, the chondrocytes, about these dots, and then grows in a slightly spatially heterogeneous way. So there's some, there's some spatial fluctuation in, in concentration. And so we wanted to understand if this heterogeneity in the distribution of constituents has important consequences for the emergent bulk properties of the tissue. So to really explore this idea, we need to uh, slightly expand upon the, uh, the model that uh, we used previously. And, and to do this, we uh, draw inspiration from a, a lovely recent paper in, in PRL about rigidity percolation in uh, colloidal systems. Uh, so I encourage you to check that one out as well. Um, so in this case, uh, we use a correlation strength C in deciding whether or not to keep a randomly chosen candidate bond. So I show you an example candidate here with a bold red stroke. Its neighbors are indicated with light blue strokes. So two bonds are considered to be neighbors if they share a vertex. Uh, and so when we select a candidate at random, we then decide whether or not to include it with a probability one minus C to the power of six minus the number of nearest neighbors. And that six is chosen because that's the maximum number of nearest neighbors that a bond could have in this Kagome lattice. And then at the current, and then NN denotes the current number of nearest neighbors that have actually been retained. So this protocol is going to essentially have a rich get richer effect. Already densely uh, populated regions of the network will be further enriched with material and sparse regions will stay relatively sparse. And so here I just show you in a, a bond portion correlation strength phase space, uh, the various sorts of, of networks can be made with, with our protocol. So uh, you see in the lower left-hand corner, a relatively sparse, and homogeneous network. And then towards the top right-hand corner, you see progressively denser and patchier networks in, in which there's more clustering of material. And so I here use the term bond portion because it's no longer the case that bonds are included with, with uh, identically and independently distributed probabilities. Now there's, there's some, some structural correlation in, in the inclusion of, of bonds in these networks. 
Okay, so now we repeat the shear modulus uh, procedure that I described previously for uh, 10 realizations for each combination of uh, correlation strength and bond portion considered in this study. So I'll show you a number of, rep of representative curves here. So the, the trend that you can see initially is that as the correlation strength is increased, the normalized shear modulus here in arbitrary simulation units uh, increases for a smaller number of retained bonds. And then um, beyond about C equals 0.6, this effect appears to actually saturate and reverse a bit. So you can see that the, the curve for uh, C equals 0.6 actually rises a bit before the curve for C equals 0.8. And uh, you can get a little bit more of a, of a bird's eye view by, by considering this heat map, where you can see uh, the transition from, from floppy on the left to rigid on the right, but uh, this the transition line is uh, once again clearly non-monotonic. So uh, it seems that uh, a correlation strength of about 0.6 is, is uh, the one which, which yields uh, rigidity percolation with the least uh, retained material. Uh, so, so to get a bit more insight into what's happening here, I want to focus in, in particular, on this transition region where networks go from, from floppy, unable to transmit force, to rigid. Uh, so we see, first of all, that uh, each of the, for each correlation strength, the uh, networks exhibit a, a power loss scaling in their shear modulus as the bond portion is increased beyond the critical value that's, that's needed to make a rigid cluster. But this, as I'll discuss in a moment, uh, the scaling exponent with which uh, the shear modulus increases with increasing bond portion varies from one correlation strength to the next. So you can see that whereas the critical number of bonds needed uh, initially decreases and then increases, the uh, scaling exponent uh, with which shear modulus increases with, with excess uh, connectivity shows the very opposite trend. Um, now, I'll note as in passing, the case of C equals zero is the homogeneous case, and, in, and that limits one good agreement with previous analytical and uh, numerical results. So it's nice write up by Xiaoming Mao and collaborators from, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think that year is incorrect. That should actually be about 2013. But anyway, that's, I uh, encourage you to look at that as well. Um, so you can see there's essentially a, a linear inverse relationship between the scaling exponent and the, the bond portion at which rigidity percolation occurs. So not merely, do, does uh, moderate correlation allow a rigid network to be formed with less material? As further bonds are added, you keep getting more bang for your buck. Okay, now that's you know a discussion of the bulk properties, but we'd also like some micro-mechanical uh, insight into why this occurs. And so to, to study this, we turn to the non-affine parameter. This is a now a well-established uh, means of quantifying mechanical heterogeneity in filamentous materials. Uh, so I, I mentioned previously that an affine deformation field is essentially one in which the, the vertices displacements all follow a global linear transformation. So in, in the case of a simple shear, that's simply given by, by the expression here. The, the X displacement component is the, sh the shearing strain magnitude epsilon times the initial Y component. And then there would be no expected displacement in the Y direction. So I show you a blue uh, affinely displaced network here overlaid with a red non-affinely displaced network. So then the non-affine component of the displacements in the relaxed state is simply the actual displacement field less the expected affine component. And by taking the mean square of non-affine displacements and normalizing by the shear strain and by the rest length, the squared rest length of a bond, one obtains the so-called non-affine perimeter for a network. And uh, this 
this parameter shows uh, a pronounced peak in each case that corresponds with the point of rigidity percolation. But an interesting feature here is that this peak becomes gradually lower and broader as the uh, correlation strength uh, is increased. So <clears throat> while the peak is, is lower, that's suggesting less overall non-affine rearrangement, non-affinity decays much more gradually as, as correlation strength is increased. So to try to get some further information as insight as, as to what's happening here, we look uh, not merely at a global characterization, but rather at um, kind of an annular average of the two-point correlator and non-affine displacement. So basically we, we look at a non-affine displacement at some position and then uh, consider every uh, point within some narrow annulus centered about that position and an average about that annulus to obtain the radially averaged uh, two-point correlator. And uh, we consistently find that this quantity uh, exhibits an exponential decay down to some constant floor. So uh, curves through the dots are, are actually exponential bits. So this, this is an excellent uh, phenomenological model in, in every case. Um, and this is in particular uh, for C equals 0.6, but uh, we obtained similar uh, results for, for other correlation strengths. And um, so you can see actually the floor to which uh, this uh, two-point correlator decays, there is non-monotonically with, uh, with a portion of bonds retained. So then if we look at this non-affine rearrangement correlation length scale uh, versus bond portion for different correlation strengths, we see that initially varying the correlation strength kind of stratifies the, the different curves. Uh, so here, um, solid curves are to guide the eye, and uh, points are, are actual uh, data points from simulations. Uh, so then you can see that eventually, however, as, as the uh, networks become filled in, these curves collapse and non-affine correlation length scales diverge towards the system size of our network. Um, and so interestingly, if you look specifically at the non-affine correlation length at the point of rigidity percolation, then as, as the uh, correlation strength increases towards one, the uh, this uh, non-affine correlation length exhibits a parallel-like divergence. So, so you see, longer and longer length scale correlations in the, in the non-affine rearrangements. Um, and interesting- Jonathan, about two oh, minutes left. Okay, perfect, two minutes. perfect. And so then, uh, yes, the final point I wanna make here is that if you, this uh, non-affine correlation length scale, uh, with the dependence of the rigidity percolation threshold on this uh, non-affine correlation length at rigidity percolation, exhibits a similar non-monotonic trend to the dependence of the rigidity percolation threshold on the portion of bonds, or pardon me, on the, on the correlation strength used to construct the network. And so the overall picture that I have now is that to some degree, clustering is useful and that it, it uh, increasing the correlation strength is useful and that it, uh, it creates rigid clusters, which uh, more efficiently transmit force throughout the network. But as uh, its degree of clustering becomes too great, you get a few stiff islands dispersed throughout the network, which are too weakly coupled by the surrounding interstitial regions to enable uh, efficient system-wide force transmission. And so then eventually you get too much of a good thing and, and increase in correlation strength beyond about 0.6 leads to, uh, once again, less efficient uh, use of material. Um, so I want to just briefly wrap up here by thanking uh, my PI's uh, project and the funding agencies who have uh, kept a roof over my head uh, past few years. I um, also want to acknowledge Thomas Wise Jackson, a uh, graduate student who just defended uh, an ETI Cohen's lab last summer. It was uh, Good, great collaborator on this work, and of course uh, the entire DASC group for their uh, for their support. And so, just uh, want to leave you with a few kind of 
take home messages here. Uh, so moderate structural correlation in dilute filamentous networks can lower the threshold uh, at which these networks become capable of transmitting forces across their extent of the system. Um, excessive correlation then eventually leads to a poor coupling of, 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 of large stiff regions and, and thus kind of causes this effect to saturate and reverse. And more broadly, it you know, may be necessary to take account of subtle details in the local geometry uh, of a system to understand certain things about its emergent bulk properties. And um, once again, I'll leave you with a reference to the paper that has all the gory details. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and invite any questions at this time. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that great talk. And I'll give you your Zoom applause. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we have time for, for a few questions. Um, feel free to touch them in the chat. I can start us off here um, and um, and ask for, uh, is there, uh, you talked about this a little bit, but can you say a little bit more about um, a, like an intuitive explanation for the inverse relationship between the um, critical bond portion and the scaling exponent? Uh, sure. So. I suppose uh, very broadly, if if um, rigidity percolation is being obtained for a lower amount of material, then it would stand to reason that this protocol essentially gives us a recipe for making making the most of each additional bond added, and so that would then suggest that the the rate of increase in stiffness of the uh, of the network should should be greatest for for that protocol, which which makes the most efficient use of each each additional uh, structural element. Now, one reason why you might see this advantage eventually diminish is that as networks become denser and denser, you know there's less and less distinction between networks with with different correlation strengths. Um, so so you can eventually see. I can maybe go back to this the part where I compare kind of shear modulus versus versus bond portion, you can eventually see that the various curves collapse on top of each other. Um, so yeah. now is I guess furthermore is as, as, as to why um, why this correlation enables one to make the most efficient use of the, of, of additional material. Um, I guess again my, my picture is is that uh, forming of rigid clusters in, in effect kind of gives you this this new this new length scale where, where you're sort of rather than having a bunch of isolated spindly bonds you sort of gather the, the bonds together into larger thicker structural elements that um, more effe effectively transmit force for a given amount of material but eventually if you make these structural elements too large you sort of You've, you've, you've misallocated your material because now there's not enough residual material to collect, to connect all of these clumps together. Um, and there's another thing I'll mention, um, since I'm thinking about it, um, this, this correlation length is, is consistently about an order of magnitude smaller than the overall system size. So, uh, we feel that we've actually identified a bulk, kind of bulk property here, that this is not a quirky finite size effect. We've also looked at networks with four and 10 times as many bonds and, and seen substantially similar uh, behavior. Um, 